If um, if you would all like to turn to the book of Zechariah. Chapter 5. To our guests, this may seem like a strange message to bring, but uh, you've joined us um, at a time where we're going through the book of Zechariah. We've already gone through, as would be obvious, we've already gone through... uh, First four chapters, uh, but those those um, messages are on the internet if you're interested in getting the whole picture of where we are up to now. Uh, but today, as I said, we're going to look at chapter five. And before we do anything else, we'll read it together. Zechariah chapter 5 verse 1. Then I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked and behold a flying roll. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is twenty cubits and the breadth thereof ten cubits. Then he said unto me, This is the curse that goes forth over the face of the whole earth for every one that stealeth shall be cut off, as on this side according to it. And every one that sweareth shall be cut off, as on that side according to it. I will also bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of his house, and shall consume it with the timber thereof, and the stones thereof. Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes and see what is this that goes forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, Moreover, this is their resemblance throughout all the earth. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. And this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. And he said, This is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah and cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. thereof, Then lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women. And the wind was in their wings, and they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lift up the ephah between the earth and heaven. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the ephah? And he said unto me, To build it a house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. An interesting chapter, I think you'll agree. Confusing on the surface, maybe, but certainly interesting. Chapter 5 is very short, once again, but it contains two distinct and different visions. Two distinct and different things for Zechariah to see. The one of them was the flying roll or scroll as we would say. And the other was that of the ephah. Now in order to understand what the significance of these things are, the significance of the overall picture, we need to understand, don't we, what each one of these things mean, what each one of these things represent, both the flying scroll, the flying roll, and the ether. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at the individual parts because I think that makes sense. So here we go. First of all, the flying roll or the flying scroll. Now before we go any further... I would like as a reminder to say that up to this point, up to this point, chapter 5 of these, uh, the writings of Zechariah, we have seen an emphasis mainly on encouragement to the people of God. Encouragement in the rebuilding of the temple, which was where 
Zechariah was at at this time, the rebuilding of the, the temple of God in Jerusalem upon the return from exile of those from Israel and Judah, predominantly, that went into Babylon. Seventy years has passed, now they're back in the land of Israel and they're about the rebuilding of the temple and Jerusalem and obviously other towns and cities throughout Judea and Israel. But we've seen up to now a predominantly encouraging message to the people of, let's say, Judah at this time. But the Israelites. Yes, we'd, we'd seen uh, the promise that God was going to deal with their enemies. He was going to deal with those whom God had used in their judgment. He was going to bring recompense to those nations. But there was generally an encouragement and a geeing up, let's say, of the people. There was a call to repentance and commitment, first of all, to God. And then also to the building of the temple. And God had promised them that he would be with them, didn't he? Throughout. And last time we saw that even to Zerubbabel, who was the the governor of Judea at this time, and, and given the responsibility of overseeing the rebuilding of both the temple and the city, that God would be with him. And God would even restore the priesthood to a state that would even eclipse that of Solomon's day. Now to understand, if you haven't heard the other messages, then I'd encourage you to listen to them to get a a better view of where we are now. But getting back to today, there was also a a prophetic, I can't even get my mouth around it, a prophetic promise of renewal and restoration of the priesthood as well as the temple and the city, which I've said. And we looked at that last time. However, here in the fifth chapter, we've got something quite different. And I want you to understand that. This fifth chapter is something quite different to what we have seen yet from the other four. As we will see as we go on, there is at the core of this particular vision, given to Zechariah, a warning. And this is a sincere and a serious warning. It's a warning to any who would reject the mercy and grace of God and his standards that are expected of people who are called by his name. We need to remember that that this vision, this word to Zechariah is predominantly to God's people. It's not for the world. It's not for the nations around Judea and Israel at this time. It is for God's people. And we'll see why as we go further. Now the use of a scroll or a roll, as is said here, in prophetic imagery in scripture is not unusual, is it? Anybody ever heard of a scroll before in in predominantly the Old Testament. It's used quite widely, isn't it? And the Hebrew word here is Megillah. Megillah. And it means roll or a volume. It's a book, basically, in scroll form. And it comes from a word, a Hebrew word, Galal. Now, some of you may recognize that root word, Galal. It's, it's the root word of Gilgal. And it means Gilgal means rolled away. That's where the reproach of Israel was rolled away through circumcision. Remember that? Okay, so Galal is the root meaning of this word. It means a roll, a scroll. It means rolled together or rolled away. And the word is used frequently in books like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, specifically. Ezekiel. It's used a lot in Ezekiel. And it usually contains... And when this use of the scroll is is used in these writings, it usually contains a warning of impending judgment. For continued rejection of God or the law 
or both. Warnings about idolatry, adultery, and such and such things. I'm talking about such things as the following. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah chapter 36, verse 1 and 2. Bear in mind, remember we're talking about the scroll, the use of the scroll here. Jeremiah 36 verse 1 says this, And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto you against Israel and against Judah, and against all the nations, from the day that I spoke to thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. Now I want you to turn to Ezekiel. Excuse me, I've just lost my... I'm not used to using a laptop for my notes. Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Remember, we're looking at the use of the scroll in Scripture. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 1 says this, Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll, and go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, Cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then I did eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. This was God telling Ezekiel to go to the people to give them the words of correction, the words of warning that God was bringing. And so you can see here, uh, therefore, that the role in our text would also seem to represent in some way judgment, the law, the purposes of God. And it's not that this is unusual, however, it's rather the dimensions of this scroll that are unusual. Did you notice the dimensions of this scroll when we read that scripture? Anybody remember what the dimensions were? 20 cubits by 10 cubits. Have you ever wondered about that? That's a big scroll. He said unto me, verse 2, Zechariah 5, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying scroll, a flying roll rather. The length thereof is 20 cubits and the breadth thereof is 10 cubits. Have you ever wondered about those dimensions? Well, I can tell you that they are the exact dimensions of the tabernacle. Not the outer court, but the tent. The holy place and the most holy place. That was 20 cubits by 10 cubits. And inside that, 10 by 10 was the most holy place. Now that brings a kind of a whole different light to this picture of a scroll, doesn't it? Those dimensions are not given by accident. They are to represent something to the mind of the Jewish people. And it brings to mind the house of God, the standards of God, the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, because that's what that tent represented to them. It was the dwelling place of Almighty God. As they dwelt in the wilderness, and for those, I think, 364 years, that it stayed at Shiloh. That was their dwelling place of God. Where he came and showed himself on the mercy seat. And consumed the blood sacrifice that took away the sin of the whole nation. 
and of the high priest. I find it striking that in our last chapter we had the image of a lampstand also used in the tent, also representative of the house of God, but also representative of the church. The body of Messiah. And now here again we have an image which is undoubtedly that of the house of God. 20 by 10. And here we have this flying image of the scroll. To me and hopefully to you this is reminding me of the following scripture. I want you to turn to 1 Peter 4 verse 17. I want you to keep that image of this scroll and what it represents, what the dimensions represent in this vision. Remember, God is speaking to his people, not to heathen, not to Gentiles. 1 Peter 4 verse 17 says this, For the, for, for the time is come that judgment must begin where? At the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Judgment begins always at the house of God. Because we are representatives. The house of God, his body, is a representative of him on the earth. And so was the temple. So were the people of God. In Zechariah's day. The impression of this is confirmed by the next two verses. And in verse 3 of our text, we see that this role is seemingly written on on both sides. Do you remember that? Verse 3. Then he said unto me, This is the curse that goeth over the face of the whole earth, and every one that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side, according to it, and every one that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side. It was written on both sides. Now this is reminiscent of the tablets of the law. Two major headings in the law of Moses were theft and fraud. Theft and fraud. And this is the two subjects that are mentioned here. Stealing and swearing falsely. And we begin to get a, an idea of what this is talking about. This is talking about the standards of God. The purity of God and his church, and his people. And this, if you like, is the standard of God passing through his people, separating the good from the bad. Can you see that picture? Theft and falsehood were believed to be the two major headings under which the Ten Commandments fell. And this is traditionally by the Orthodox Jews. The Jews believe this. In their earliest writings. And one very interesting word in this verse is the word curse. Do you know, this is the curse that goes throughout all the earth. And this is the Hebrew word Allah. Allah. Is that reminiscent to anyone? The word does mean curse, but it can also mean, in dictionary terms, it's also used as anathema. Does that sound familiar? It means anathema. Anathema is a word used five times in the New Testament. And this gives us a slightly better idea of, of what it means. So let's, I'm going to read to you. You don't have to turn to these if you don't want. But here are some Five uses. Romans 9, chapter 3. 
And remember, we're looking at anathema or accursed or curse. For I could wish, this is Romans 9, verse 3, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. It's Paul speaking there. That's this same word, Allah. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3 says this, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Holy Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. And that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. That word accursed is this word anathema, which means the same as Allah, this curse. Galatians 1, verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, but that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. The same word, anathema. Galatians 1 verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that that we received, let him be accursed, let him be anathema. And finally, 1 Corinthians 16 verse 22. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Maranatha. Anathema. Five uses of that one word, and they all mean the same as this Hebrew word Allah. Curse. That's how serious this word is. Now it's plain to see that at the time, this only concerned those people in Judea, didn't it? God is speaking this word to Zechariah, and Zechariah is to give it to the people predominantly in Judea, because it's to there that the people re- returned. Those who belonged to God and were charged with his work, charged with being his representatives in the earth. His representatives, his ambassadors, if you like, to the other nations around them. This was their responsibility. And it's also plain from the wording that's used that it's also speaking of a time when his people will be found across the whole earth. This curse goes throughout the earth, it says. So it's also speaking of our day. We find Jewish people everywhere around this world and not only that but we find born again believers around the world everywhere don't we we're one in Christ Jesus so that this includes us as well as them one in Christ Jesus to them also comes this warning a warning of what will happen to those who do not live a life worthy of the name above all names who do not live according to the standards that God demands of his people because they are and we are representatives of him on the earth to the world it's a serious matter isn't it so what is written in in verse 4 of our text fits in so well with what is said in the following verses Verse 4 of our text says, I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that swears falsely. In other words, to him who really rejects the standards of God in the house of God. Because this is exactly what we're talking about. Remember I said that he's talking to the people of God, not to the heathen. And so he's also speaking to us hundreds of hundreds of years further down the road in this day. It shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that swears falsely by my name. By my name. And it shall remain in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. The timber and the stones were the fabric of the building. 
We are living stones. We are living timbers of his household. And so it fits in very well, that verse, with 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17 and 18, which I'm going to read to you now. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17 and 18 says this. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? We've already read that before, haven't we? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Mm. That's a bit fierce, isn't it? And if the if this judgment begins with us, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? So there are tight standards for God's people to adhere to. And this is a brief look, just this look at the flying roll and what it represents. It's a brief look about this part of the vision. But it's one that certainly concerns all of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in the truth of the gospel and want to live according to his standards. Want to live according to the life of Jesus Christ in us. Do we want to live that way? Do we want more of Christ to be alive in us and less of us? Remember what John the Baptist said. He must increase. I must decrease. And so it is with each and every one of us. And so it was in Zechariah's day. God wanted them to know that this just wasn't any other rebuilding program. He was going to build his church. And his church would be something special. His church would be something better than anything around them. But in building it, it would have to be built his way. Does that sound familiar? According to the pattern. We've, we've seen that in other chapters of Zechariah. Building according to God's pattern. And he reminds us once again of what that pattern is through this flying scroll. The dimensions of it are unmistakable. It's the pattern that was shown Moses on the mount. And it represents the holiness and the purity of God to the body of Christ. So that's a brief look at the role. How much longer have we got? We haven't even got onto the ephah yet. But let's turn to that now for time. Does everybody follow that? I hope so. The ephah. The ephah was the largest and generally the most used um, capacity of weight for, for dry goods like grain. It was, it was the largest amount, if you like, that was used in the weighing of grain and that sort of thing. And the woman in the ephah represents wickedness in Judea. And I want you to remember that. It's wickedness in Judea. Wickedness amongst the people of God. Wickedness in the body of Christ. He's not talking about the heathen here. He mentions those separately. The ephah was the largest capacity for weighing dry goods like grain, wheat, flour and such like barley. The woman represents the wickedness and by extension the church. And the lead weight really represents the weight of the law. The judgment of God. There's no escape from the judgment of God, is there? And there was no escape for this woman trapped in the ether by God. 
And the idea here is that God was finally bringing judgment upon those within the household of faith who had, as Isaiah had written, the following. Isaiah 29, verse 13. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honour me, but have removed their hearts far from me. And their fear towards me is taught by the precepts of men. There was no real fear of God. There was no reverence for who God is and was. It was merely words going through the ritual. And this is the people that Isaiah, that God was revealing to Isaiah. And Jesus himself quoted this in Matthew 15 verse 8. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. See, it's not just speaking about Zechariah's day. It's not even just speaking about Isaiah's day. He's speaking about the people of God, no matter what day it may be. And they were, in fact, in both cases, and in Zechariah, fulfilling what was said in the following verses. And I'm going to read Matthew 23, verses 30 to 33. Matthew 23, verse 30. And say, if we had been in the days before, uh, sorry, in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, you be witnesses unto yourselves that you are children of them that killed the prophets. Fill you up then the measure of your fathers. You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell. They are the words, not my words, they are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ to those within the church who were looked on as leaders, teachers of the faith, teachers of the word of God, custodians of the truth. And here Jesus calls them generation of vipers, But you notice he also says in verse 32, fill you up then the measure of your fathers. What did we say about the ephah? The ephah is a measure. It's the largest measure for dry goods. And that was used as the final straw for the wicked in Judea. And here Jesus is saying, fill you up then the measure of your fathers. There is a limit that God will go to before judgment comes. But once that measure is full, judgment will come. And it will come first at the house of God, as we're told in this vision. It was then this filling up of the measure, the ephah that we see in our text. This wicked and rebellious portion of the church then is carried off to a place called Shinar. Anybody know where Shinar is? Babylon. Babylon. It's another word for Babylon. And the first time we hear of that name is way back in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 10. And where we learn first of Nimrod, the founder of what we now call Babylon. Babel, as it was then called. Remember the Tower of Babel? They tried to build and and reach the very throne room of God. We can be like God. We don't need his help. Nothing new under the sun. God doesn't change, and his standards certainly don't. It's ironic then that this ephah is carried back to the very place where the first kingdom 
was established. Kingdom of man was established. Babel, Babylon. And this was the very place that the first kingdom of man rose up in defiance against God. So it's therefore a a fitting place, don't you think, for the wickedness in the church to be sent? I don't believe this to be a a real geographical uh, movement back to Chaldea or as Iraq, as we know it now. I don't believe it's a, it's a, it's a physical, actual, geographical movement of this people, but it certainly is symbolic. It's a picture of a separation occurring. Clean separation between the true church and that which is mixed with the world. Do we have anything like that about today? I think so. In verse 10, we've got of our text, Zechariah 5. Verse 10, we have Zechariah asking where this prophetic group are going. And the answer is that they're heading for Shinar, which we already know is Babylon. But they are, but once there, they are to build their own house. They're to build their own temple. Don't you think that's strange? Once they've been carried away to this place called Shinar, they're to build their own temple. Let's read that again. Verse 10. Then I said to the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the ephah? And verse 11. And he said unto me, To build it a house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. Her own base. Isn't that interesting? The church is the bride of Christ. But you know, there's a false church. There is a false bride that is going to be judged. And this is what God is speaking to Zechariah, speaking about this false bride. And I know that what I'm about to say may shock some people. So please don't throw anything hard. You might damage the microphone. What I'm about to say may be a shock to some people. Some will not agree, but please bear with me. Because I'm going to speak it from the word. I'm going to try and show you from the word that this is what it's actually saying. This last verse is speaking about a final end-time religion. A final end-time false bride. Would you agree? Okay. And it will be a false religion. And I believe it to be the Antichrist religion. The religion that Antichrist will ultimately take headship of. And I believe this last verse to be a reference to the reign of Antichrist. And that, ready for it, in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. Because that's where the Antichrist is going to set up his false throne. Before our Lord, the true Messiah, returns to overthrow him. I believe that this last verse is a reference to the reign of Antichrist and that in Jerusalem. There are several places referred to as Babylon throughout scripture. Babylon's an obvious one. We all know that. It's Babylon. But there are other places. Rome is spoken of as Babylon by Peter. 1 Peter 5 verse 13. Those who are in Babylon salute you, send you greetings. And even Jerusalem is mentioned as Babylon. And I want you to read with me Revelation verse 11 verse 8. Revelation verse ele- uh, chapter 11 sorry, verse 8. 
Are you there yet? Revelation 11, verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Was that Rome? Was it Babylon? No, it was Jerusalem. Where else would the devil or Satan choose as the place to attempt to usurp Messiah's throne? But the place where Messiah is prophesied to return. I want you to think about this. Could we even suggest that the Babylon spoken throughout Revelation could indeed be Jerusalem? I'm not saying it is, but I want you to think about it as a possibility. We all think, or many of us think, well, it's speaking of Rome probably, or or, or Babylon itself, Iraq. But Revelation says the dead bodies will lie in the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, also where our Lord was crucified. It's a wicked city. Israel is no purer than Britain. Jerusalem is no more holy than London. But this is the centre of the turmoil of the world. And if you go there, you will see and feel the tangible oppression that's in that place. There is pure evil in that place. And I'm just putting it to you that this place, this Shinar, this Babylon that the false church is to be built on isn't in Iraq, but it will be Jerusalem. The spiritual Babylon. Until Christ returns and sets up his rule and reign. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad? Bless you. Aren't you glad that there's going to be an overthrowing of whatever is false in this world? And it's coming, brothers and sisters. It's coming soon. There is coming a judgment. And whatever is false in the body of Christ is going to be cast into the ether. The measure of God is going to be weighed to the full. And his law is going to shut closed on that ether. And there's no escape once that happens. What is going to happen will happen. And it will happen, I believe, in Jerusalem. The false temple, the false saviour, Antichrist, will sit in it. Scripture tells us so. The spiritual Babylon, which has resisted the truth to this day and will be so readily receptive of another Jesus. How do we know that? Because Jesus told us so. Turn with me to John 5, verse 43. Jesus' own words to his people. Was this a foreshadowing of this scroll? Jesus fulfilled the law, didn't he? He was the law. He is the law. He is the fulfillment of the law. He represents everything that is righteous, pure, holy in God. John 5, verse 43. Jesus speaking to the people of Jerusalem. I am come in my Father's name. And you receive me not. 
If another shall come, in his own name, him you will receive. It's happened before. The Jews accepted a man, a rabbi called Bar Kopa, in 150 AD, caused the death of hundreds of thousands of Jews, that rebellion, against Rome. But it's one the true church never entered into. And I've said before, that was, that was the event that caused the complete split of those who are true messianic believers, true believing Jews in Messiah, Jesus Christ, from those of what we would call orthodox or ultra-orthodox Judaism today. That was the separation point because the true believers refused to fight. But it caused a terrible slaughter of the Jewish people and an ultimate dispersion throughout the known world. And yet another remodeling of Judaism to what we see today. But another will come in his own name and you will receive him. Jesus' own words to his own people in Jerusalem. This is a warning. The flying scroll and the ephah are two parts of the same vision. One is a warning, one is the result of disobedience to God's people. It was a warning to Zechariah. It was a warning to the people of his day. And it's a warning to the church today. May God bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, shall we? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love us so much that you send us these warnings. You love us so much you don't desire us to be caught out in any way. But you continue to warn, to guide, to correct, to chide and to encourage your people. Heavenly Father, take us this day. Mould us and shape us according to your will. Let our hearts and our minds be steadfast in you in this day. Lord, it's so difficult in these days of growing darkness, wickedness and evil. But we know that you are above all things. You are our strong tower. You are our sovereign Lord. And you will keep him whose mind is steadfast in you in perfect peace. So Lord, take us this day. Use us for your will. Use us for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.